Thank you. Take your Bible. Turn with me to the book of Job, chapter number 13. And, uh, oh, this message, I had it planned out for a little bit. And, uh, boy, I was doing the finishing touches, and that song hit me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And uh, I got it in my notes, ready for Pastor Matt Nettesheim to sing. Then I started thinking, I said, this is a bad idea. And uh, so this afternoon, I called Matthew, and I said, man, we need a group just to sing that. Could you do that? And they put that together. Praise the Lord. That was a late request by Pastor Nettesheim. And that, that song is powerful. Uh, thinking about the, the man Job, a great man of God, who went through some trials, struggles, maybe more difficult than we have ever gone through. But he was able to say, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. We're going to go a little bit more into detail on this story of Job. But, you know, Job was a humble man. Job was not a man filled with pride. He didn't live a life all about himself. And really, often he would look inwardly at his struggles and difficulties, and and he would try to turn himself to the Lord. And, And this is important. You know, you and I, we have a choice. We can be filled with pride. We can be filled with uh, a haughty spirit, and we can say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm okay, uh, God needs to take me where I'm at and just accept me for who I am, and, and we can have a haughty spirit, and in having a haughty spirit, a life of pride, boy, the Lord takes his hand of blessings off of us, but Job uh, shows us the opposite of that, he shows a spirit of humility, And in these verses right there, you'll you'll get to Job chapter 13 where it'll say, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And praise the Lord for that. And then in chapter 14, you remember, uh, it says, Man that is born of of woman is of few days and full of trouble. And in the midst of chapter 13, between those verses, there's an interesting verse. And and if you read it and think about it, 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 it shows Job's humility And he'll say, make me, basically, make me to know my transgression and my sin. Let's just stand and let's read this verse. Job chapter 13, verse number 23. And we'll we'll read it through three times. I know it's one verse. We'll read this verse three times. And each time, try to get yourself a little bit more familiar with that phrase, make me to know my transgression and my sin. Let's read verse 23. Ready? How many are mine iniquities and sins... Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Now, stop. We're going to read again. You see his humility? He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm so imperfect. I have problems with sin. I struggle with iniquity and sin. And there are many of them. And then he says, make me to know my transgression and my sin. And he's, he's even asking the Lord, make it apparent. Make it clear where I have shortcomings in my life. Make it obvious where I'm failing you. Help me to clearly see that because I want to please you in all that I say, think, and do. Let's read it again. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. One more time. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. The title of the message this evening is simply, Make Me to Know My Sin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. My, what a good night. The, the music, the choir, the orchestra playing, that offertory, I believe, honored you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you help us as we open your word. We look at Job, boy, the tremendous trials and difficulties went, to, went through and how humble he was. And Lord, I pray you help us to be a church filled with saved folks who cast out the haughty spirit, cast out the pride, and we really search our hearts. We look and and try to have a a life that pleases you in everything that we do, Lord. We love you. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Make me to know my sin. And if you would like to follow along a little bit, if you go back to Job chapter 1, I just want to fill in some of the details of the life of Job, an amazing man 
of God. Amazing, really. Uh, one of the mountain peaks of, of scriptures is Job chapter 1 and 2. And I, I'll tell you what, I get emotional when I read it. I, I read it, and you, you know the story of him losing his wealth, and he loses his health, he loses, and his wife goes and says, why don't you curse God and die? And man, I, I, it hits me every time. Like every time you get there, and uh, you know, even studying for this, it made me, me cry. And thinking about all the struggles and difficulties that Job went to. And you look at verse number one there. There was a man in the land of what? Us. And, uh, you know, that's interesting. Us. And, you know, in the book of Genesis, there was Huz. It says his firstborn and Buzz, his brother. And so you have Huz in the Bible. You have Buzz in the Bible. And you have us in the Bible. If any of you ladies have triplets, it would be neat to have Huz, Buzz, and Us. And uh, there's hope right there, I guess, someday uh, for that. But there was a man in the land of Us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And, and you look at Job, that word eschewed, he shunned and he avoided evil. And here, here's a man. And he's living in that land of us and the east. And man, he's a man that fears God. He's perfect and upright. He is living day after day trying to please the Lord. And it's interesting. The Bible said that he eschewed evil. Uh, he didn't run to sin. He ran from sin. And you can see him maybe going to the local Kroger or the local grocery store. And as he goes to the grocery store, he knows that he wants to get a, a uh, thing of bottled water. And he about enters that aisle right there. And then all of a sudden he enters and realizes, man, this water's on the same aisle as all this alcohol. I don't want to walk through that. And so he steps around and maybe uh, nobody else in us is convicted about that. But certainly he doesn't want anybody to think he's in that aisle. And he chews evil. He shuns it. He runs from it. And he goes back around. And, and you can see him making decisions like that. Some would say, you know, you're a little uh, over the top Job, but he was a man that eschewed evil. He shunned it. He stayed away from it. He guarded himself. And as you continue to read in verse number two, it talks about seven sons and three daughters. He had great substance, 7,000 sheep, 3,000, 3,000 camels. What do you do with 3,000 camels? But he had them, 3,000 camels. Think about the mess of cleaning up after seven or 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. He was a great man. And we think about Job, he was a great man. God's blessing was upon him. He's living for the Lord. He's perfect and upright. Boy, he eschews evil. He's living a life that's holy and acceptable unto uh, the Lord. And that's, that's good, is not? Boy, I'm thankful for Job. I'm thankful for his stand. I'm thankful for his love of God. Amen. Now, the story continues, and, and he, he's worried about his children. Worried, or he's concerned about his children. He, he loves his children. He has a relationship with his children. You know, his, I believe, seven sons and three daughters. And the Bible says that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings then it says, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did God, uh, thus did Job continually. He, he really was concerned about his, his sons and his children not living for the Lord. And so he'd get up in the morning and he would go to the Lord on their behalf. God, boy, my, my son. Ah, God, my daughter. Boy, I want them to serve you. I want them to live for you. And uh, Lord, you, you, you need to protect them and help. You can see him praying to, for, for God to make him a good father. Uh, you can see him praying and asking the Lord to, to bless him as a, a husband so he can have a good, strong marriage so they can raise their children for the Lord and, and really be a good example as they get into their later years. And he was concerned. He loved his children. By the way, there's so many sermons involved in this. But I, I want to be one that's concerned about my children, that loves my children, that prays for my children, that uh, sets a good example for my children. And then the story begins to take a turn interesting turn and uh, it talks about the the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord 
and Satan came also among them. And that's hard to picture. That's hard to understand. But there ensues a conversation between the Lord and Satan. The Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and ensueth evil. You, you see he, see God's bragging on Job. Amen. You know, that's one day I'd love for, for God to look to me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'd like that. Right. I don't expect that. Uh, but, you know, he's bragging on Job. Right. That, that's awesome. That's amazing that God looks and he says, that's, that's my, my man right there. That's Job. Boy, he's living for me, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do. Job's living that way. Amen. And, uh, oh boy, then things change. Satan answered the Lord and said, does, does Job fear God for naught? And Satan is what we would call the accuser of the brethren. He steps in, he looks at Job and he says, <laughs> You think he's all that, huh? You know, the only reason he serves you is because you're so good for him. You take your hand a blessing off him. He'll turn his back on you. And uh, he continues, Hast thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? And the story begins to change. God says, go ahead. Go ahead and you can do what you will to, to Job and uh, go ahead. And next thing you know, Boy, his servants are slain with the edge of the sword. A fire from heaven falls and burns up the sheep and, and the servants, and they're consumed. And the Chaldeans begin to fall on their camels and carry them away. And then next thing you know, his sons and daughters all die. Boy, you read that. And, and that happened. That happened. Imagine you in the place of Job. I'm living for you, Lord. Woo! Man, you blessed me, Lord. Man, it's good serving you. Look at all of the blessings. Look at my seven sons and three daughters. Man, my 3,000 camels. Life is good. He goes and prays that morning. And next thing you know, things change and they change quickly. Boy, he loses everything. He loses his servants. He loses his camels. He loses everything. His children, they're gone. And imagine, just imagine, how would you feel? What would you say? A state of shock? Yeah. <sighs> Tells us in verse 20 that Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and worshiped. Well, you know, you can just see him. It's like, I don't know what to do. Just gets down on the ground and begins to worship the Lord. And the words that he says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. And I don't think he said it haughty. I just, it's just naked. I came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave. The Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I don't, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I, I have a heart for God. Like I wish I would. I just don't know. I don't know. You know, and you, you'll read a little bit later. We're going to take the time to do it. But his wife had a different thought on the whole process right there. And, uh, you know, and there's some conversation between Job and his wife we'll get to. But that, that's where that song, you know. As the sun rose that morning on the day of Job's trial, he rose up to serve God as any other day. Bound and determined to live in God's favor, and nothing would stand in his way. I don't know if I got it right, but it's okay. Then the messengers came one by one with their stories. In just a few moments, just a few moments, just a few moments, Job lost all he had. Great wealth and riches, the health of his body, and even his children were dead. And then the song turns and says, The Lord giveth, the Lord 
Take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've served him before and I'll serve him again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, I, you know our sermon's from chapter 13. But to understand 13, we've got to understand who he was. I'm not Job. I, I, I really, you know, I know we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, but man, Job's a godly man. Amen. He's a great man of God. Amen. And, and the story continues, you, you know, not to elongate it, but uh, in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. It would have been foolish for him to charge God. It would have been foolish for him to turn against God. It would have been foolish for him to be angry with God. Amen. By the way, it's, it's foolish for us to ever be angry with God. Amen. Because God's in control. Right. God knows what he's doing. Yeah. But in my weak state, sometimes I question him. Job didn't. He's a better man than me. Chapter 2, sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? Did you see what just happened? Woo, blessed be the name of the Lord. Didn't you hear it? Didn't you hear it? He feareth God and sheweth evil. Satan answered the accuser of the brethren and said, skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give, a, give for his life. Put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's thine, but save his life. So Satan, uh, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. You can almost see him lying there. <laughs> A mess. Well, lost everything. Now his health's gone. He's a mess. Physically, you know, boils. Mm, doesn't feel good. Boy, pain. Struggle sleeping. Difficulties. All of that. He took a potsherd to scrape himself with all. And he sat down among the ashes. And then verse 9, it says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> Job's wife came before him to voice her opinion. She said, you should end it. Just curse God and die. Job rose from the ashes. He looked toward the heaven. He brushed back the tears in his eyes. The Lord giveth, he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've served him before and I'll serve him again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, I, I probably, and I don't mean to say this, but in truth, I would probably be more like the wife than him. I don't like saying that. It's embarrassing saying that, but I know how weak I am. And we would like to be where Job is. Sometimes we're not. <laughs> you know, his wife was a real help. But he said to her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women, speaketh. What? By the way, when I speak that way, I'm foolish. Yes. When I speak that way, or even if I think that way, I'm foolish. Foolish. And you, you look at the way he said that. You, you speak as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now that's the backdrop to the story. And then he gets his three friends that come. And, you know, his friends. In verse number 11, Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come and to mourn with him and to comfort him. And you begin to read the story and the interactions. And, and you get to chapter 13. And remember that verse we started with. Job gets up in his speech and, and really is telling these three friends, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. After all the dialogue, he's saying, listen, it doesn't matter. Boy, if God wants to take away things, though, and he's not only trying to, well, he's not worried about himself, he's trying to help these three understand the power of God. 
He's trying to help these three understand that God's in control. In his weakness, he's trying to help these people understand that our God is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's, everything's all right. He's a, he's a good man. He's a good man. Then you get to the sermon. Chapter 13, if you, you look at this verse again, chapter number 13, and look at with me at verse number 23. Job, who's a great man, says, how many are mine iniquities and sins? <laughs> I, I want to just take Job and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> Job, you're about as good as they get. What do you mean, how many are your iniquities and sins? Don't you understand what you just went through? Don't you understand the difficulties and struggles that you got up and you stood for God? But Job thinks differently. He knows how imperfect he is. He knows his inside of him is that sinful flesh that we all have for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And he says those, those words, those, those words that we all need to be reminded, uh, how many are mine iniquities and sins, then he goes a step further. Not only how many, but he realizes, he, he says to God, make me to know my transgression, my sin. In other words, he, he has such a spirit of humility. He says, God, how many are my sins, my iniquities, but make me even see the ones I don't even see. Help me to open my eyes to areas where I'm not pleasing you. Help me, God, to have such a spirit of humility to where I'm willing. By the way, I want, I want the spirit of humility to be at the place where I'm willing to say, God, search me, Amen. try me, Amen. look on me and say, if there's anything that displeases you, please, Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord, watch over me. First getting saved. You know, you can look back to when you first got saved. I was 19. I was a mess. Many of you maybe got saved at a young age. You've grown in a Christian home. Praise the Lord for that. You are blessed to live in a Christian home. But I get saved. I have no idea that, boy, so many things I have in my life are displeasing to the Lord. But you begin to read the Bible, and the Bible begins to convict you about those things. And you realize, God... There's nothing off the table. Thy will be done. What it is uh, in my life, whatever you want, we throw it out the window. But as you go through the years, boy, there's so much. There's so much. And have you ever gotten 10 years into your Christian life, 20 years in your Christian life, and you look back, maybe 25 years, and all of a sudden you realize, wow, have I been wrong for a long time. Wrong about how good I am. Wrong about how great I am. You know, the, somebody's got a soul winning jacket. Me, a great soul winner. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, you're really great. I'm really great, look at me. We're not. And Job didn't have that attitude. He had a spirit of humility. Make me to know my sin. Make me to know my sin. Make me, it's humility. If you'll go over to Psalm chapter 19. Make me to know my sin. Psalm chapter 19 is a powerful chapter, and you, you know a lot of it, I'm sure. The law of the Lord, this 19, chapter number 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, woo, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord, and speaking of the Bible, all these verses right here about the Bible, the power of the Bible, how they lead you to getting saved. They lead you to making good uh, choices, to uh, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Then this way our attitude should be. Moreover, to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, that's God's word, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, that's God's word, there is great reward. We all agree with that. We agree with that? Amen. Boy, the Bible, whoo, man, it's a glorious book, a wonderful book. Praise God for his guidance and direction. It's Bible Sunday. We understand that. And, and by following the word of God, there's great reward. Then verse 12 happens. Who can understand his errors? 
Cleanse thou me from secret faults. When we think about that word secret, uh, cleanse me from my hidden faults, my unknown faults, things that I don't even know I'm doing wrong. That's David. That's David. A man after God's own heart. At this period of time, there's such a spirit of humility. He knows the power of God's word, but then he asks God. He says, God, help me to see things in my life that don't please you. Now, I'm going somewhere. There's, there, we're going somewhere with this. That's needed. Needed for me. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy, by the way, it says then, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Those are just loud, outspoken sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You, you see, Job... A great man, greater man than us. You see David, a oh, great man of God, and both of them have a spirit of humility. Uh, they don't say, look at how great I am. They don't stand on the street corners and point me, I'm the great Christian. They both look inwardly and are saying basically the same thing. They're saying those words, make me to know my sin. I want to be, have a heart that honors you. I want to have a life that pleases you, Lord. Amen. And they have a desire to live for God. Amen. A heart of pride is different, though. Boy, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And, and often we have a struggle with pride. I have a struggle with pride. What, what do I need to change in my life? I'm good. I'm the pastor of Chesapeake Baptist Church. I got a family with 12 kids serving the Lord. I am the man. I'm not. But I'm saying we can have that spirit. Who are you to say I'm wrong about anything? Don't you know who I am? Oh, yeah, Miss Nelson. Oh, yeah. No wonder you love me. But you understand, that's not, that's not a good spirit for a Christian to have. We're to have the spirit of humility. Uh, restore such one of the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be attempted. That's a spirit of humility. Our Sunday school lesson today, uh, boy, wherefore him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. That's a spirit of humility. It's found throughout the scriptures. And make me to know my sin. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. The world, by the way, gets farther and farther away from biblical values. And uh, the more we as Christians stick out like sore thumbs, uh, we dress differently, talk differently, we have different values, different morals. A new convert comes into our church. Like, where did these people come from? They've never read the Bible. They have near, no influence from the Bible. They don't have any understanding about the Bible. They're like, whoa, whoa, where did you guys come from? And then think about the battle that begins to rage inside of them. I've never done it that way before. And they have a choice whether they get into the Word of God and allow the Word of God to be able to cleanse them to wash them, to direct them, to guide them. They have to make serious decisions about their friends. They have to make serious decisions about every aspect of their life. And you know the only way they're going to make it is humility. It doesn't matter the way the world goes. It matters what God says. It doesn't matter what my friends say. It matters thus saith the Lord. It doesn't matter what anybody does. It matters the word of God. Amen. By the way, you know, Probably that's the way you've been. That's the way I've been. But it's easy to slip back. Easy to go back. I got it all figured out. <laughs> I'm Matt Nettison. I'm Matt Nettison. And, and I've said that before. I'm not trying to park there. But, but that's the sermon. I'm not preaching necessarily to a new convert. I'm preaching to us tonight. Because sometimes we drift back to that place of pride. We've got it all figured out. What we're going to do with our lives. What we're going to do with everybody. And we never ever make statements. Make me to know my sin. We never make any statements like. Hey Lord help me. Uh, cleanse me from those secret faults. And in doing so. I believe we miss out on a better blessing. A better blessing. A blessing or having God's hand upon us. I don't know how to describe that. 
But, but I, I think that when one of the reasons Job was looked down and said, that's my man, my God, because he had a spirit of humility. Amen. Spirit of humility. Amen. You know, I, I want our church. You know, I, I, I don't like even ever saying that our church is better than any other church. I think it's dangerous. I don't, I don't like that. I want there to be other good churches out there. And by the way, I can't live for another church. I can't run another church. I'm not meant to be another church. I have, I have to, to pastor this church, be a part of this church. I want our church to have a spirit of humility, not a spirit of pride saying we're better than anybody. Amen. I don't think it's right. Sure, there's, there's church, you know, it's just like a sinner. It's like preaching against fornication, all that, of course. There's, there's bad things that happen. But you understand my point. You understand so what are we to do? Look over at first, 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is awesome. Yes, amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Pauline, uh, it's not the epistle, it's sort of a pastoral epistle to Timothy. Hey, Timothy, let me teach you uh, some things about the ministry. Young Timothy, walk beside my side. I, I want to walk beside me. I want to show you how to live for God. And uh, chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. <laughs> strive. Woo! Look what we did. Boy, if you could do a little bit more, you could sort of catch up with our church a little bit. Uh, strive and battle. We're better than everybody else. No, no, no. That's a wrong thing game to play. Amen. It's a wrong game to play. Uh, you know, Brother Jordan, I'm better than you. Oh yeah. Now we can do that in some uh, uh, musical chairs, but in reality, listen, there's none good, no, not one. Boy, God's blessed him. He's a different man than me. He's, a, he's got an answer to God. He's got a great wife and little Uriah. He's doing a great job. I have zero to benefit by him, by him losing. He's a great man. Brother Jordan's a great man. Amen. Is he perfect? No. But he's, he's doing Amen. a good job. And, and you understand, and I, it's not to be a battle between I'm better than anybody. There's, you know, there's none of that. So, and the servant of the Lord is, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. What is that word? Patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Why? If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. What are we to do? There's the other side of the equation. Because... In reality, often we're dealing people who are not living, make me to know my sin. And first of all, I want to have the spirit of humility where I live in a way where I'm trying to please God in all that I say, think, or do. But I live in a world where there's some that don't. And, and, now, this, this follow with me. It can be your wife. It could be your husband. It could be your child. It could be your grown child. It could be somebody you work with. It could be uh, another church member. It could be your pastor. So we, we know we personally make me to know my sin, but how do we deal with people who oppose themselves? How do we deal with people who are lifted up with pride, who are shooting themselves in the foot, who are killing themselves spiritually, sometimes ruining their marriage, sometimes ruining their lives by making terribly bad decisions? How are we to deal with them? That's a good question, isn't it? Yes, sir. This tells us, boy, we are to be gentle unto all men. We're to be apt, ready to teach. We're to be patient. We're in meekness, not thinking that we're better than anybody else, not thinking that we're greater than anybody else, instructing them as best we can, those that oppose themselves, hoping if God peradventure will give them repentance, a change of mind to the acknowledging the truth. In other words, we have a hopeful thought, hoping that they're going to not live that way forever, that they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot forever, that they're not going to live in a spirit of pride forever, that they will make another decision and get right with the Lord. And that, that's, that, that sometimes can be hard. That can be, be hard. You can almost read a little bit about Job doing that with his three friends, can you not? See that? You see 
it, it throughout the Bible, you know, so many stories and thoughts. Pastor, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Poor Brother Whitehouse, you know, he had me preach for him last Sunday. I preached for him last Sunday afternoon. Amen. And uh, boy, he got a text this week and it was a long text. Pastor, I, we need to have a powwow, basically. We need to have a church uh, meeting about the event that happened and I subjected my kids to on Sunday. And he said, what do I do? I said, well, call him and see what it's all about. Then he calls back and he says, well, pastor, you're the problem. And I said, what did I do? He said, well, you pounded on the pulpit. I stood on a wall. And uh, I spoke with too much authority. And the person there said that they're used to a different type of preaching. And where the preacher gets behind the pulpit with a little stool and they don't really preach the word, they discuss the word with everybody. And you know, in, in, when I talked to Brother Whitehouse about it, our, our heart was broken. Amen. Because here this lady and her husband and their children are making decisions, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. There's no, what does the Bible say? There's no, make me to know my sin. There's a haughty spirit, there's pride. There's no pastor, uh, help me with this. There's none of that. It's like, bless God, you better be this way. We need to have a powwow and our church wants to lead you, Mr. Whitehouse, to be a pastor that sits behind there. You don't speak with authority. Certainly don't pound your fist right there and you do what we tell you to do. That, that's, the way, that's what yeah. they're wanting. Amen. But that, 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 that dear lady shooting herself in the foot, killing her kids, yeah, right. it's destroying her life right there. Now, how are we to, to approach that lady? Spirit of humility. Yes, sir. And really, boy, ma'am, I know what you're saying. The Bible says this. Now, we love you. We care for you. But what you're doing is, is making some big mistakes. And we love you. We care for you. And we're here for you. But you have to understand what you're doing is killing your, your, your family, everything, by making those decisions. You tell them the truth. But you're doing a spirit of meekness, not thinking that you're better than them. Right. You understand that? Yeah. Okay, somebody makes a, a decision about their marriage. They begin to have marriage troubles. And you see in front of them, they're destroying their marriage. They're making decisions that affect their kid. They're making big decisions that affect their kids. Oh, bless God, they get what they deserve. No. No, our heart breaks. Yes, sir. Our heart breaks. Right. Because we love them. Amen. We care for them. We try as best we can. We go out of our way to share the love of Christ with them and say, listen, look what you're doing. Let me help you. Let me guide you. Help. Don't do this. Amen. Sometimes it's approached with not make me to know my sin. It's, Who are you to talk to me like that? Or other things like that. I'm not saying always. We're done. Make me to know my sin. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. I am burdened. I pray that you help us to not be a prideful, arrogant church filled with a haughty spirit. Help me not be a pastor that's filled with pride, arrogancy, and a haughty spirit. Help us to see how great Job was. Imperfect, yes, but that great man had the spirit of humility and was asking you to really to make his sin known. And I pray that you help us as dads, as moms, as uh, sons and daughters, as people that live out in the world but not are of the world, have a spirit of humility, help us to have wisdom as we approach people that are really shooting themselves in the foot. Lord, I pray you bless us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Invitation.